Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our webinar this evening. My name is Julia Priestley, and I'm one of the joint CEOs at the BTF. We're very pleased that so many of you decided to join us on this lovely evening. Well, I'm sure it's a lovely evening for most of you, a lovely warm evening, um, in which we'll be focusing on thyroid disorders in young people and children. We're very grateful that, you know, you've decided to uh, to, to be to, to join us. I know it's it's, it's lovely outside. This is the second webinar that we've held for families and young people in this series of Meet the Expert webinars. The first looked at why and how thyroid disorders present in children and babies. But we get so many questions um, through our webinars, um, through our um, email service and on the telephone service and in our Facebook group about managing the condition as young people grow up and go through the teenage years that we thought it would be really helpful to have a slightly different focus tonight. Before I introduce you to our two fantastic speakers, I thought I'd just give a quick plug for the BTF and the work we do to support young people with thyroid disorders. Um, all of our funding comes from membership fees and donations. So if you'd like to support our, our charity enable us to, and enable us to continue to provide free information events like this, please do consider joining the BTF or making a donation. We're the only organisation that um, has a dedicated um, research fund for thyroid, uh, for thyroid disorders in the UK. And for the last 25 years, we've provided research funding every single year. And many of the research awards, uh, awards have gone to projects involving babies and young people. So we really hope that we'll be able to continue to support research into thyroid disease in the future. And we've just launched a research appeal, funding appeal for uh, dedicated to research for next year. So if you would like to uh, support us in any way, we'd be very grateful. So now I'm delighted to introduce you to our two excellent and highly regarded speakers who've kindly given up their time on this warm evening. Professor Tim Cheatham is a paediatric endocrinologist at Newcastle-upon-Tyne Hospital's NHS Trust. And Dr. James Law is a consultant endocrinologist at Nottingham University Hospital's NHS Trust. Both between them, they have uh, years of experience and a very keen interest in looking after children and young people with thyroid disorders. Um, I'm sure that many of you will have questions for them, so please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box on the screen at any point. We'll try to pick them up. Um, and rather than give you presentations, which um, many of you seen, many of you were seen presentations about um, thyroid disease before, they thought they'd do it slightly differently tonight. And they're going to go through each of the topics that we've said we'll be discussing and chat through the issues between themselves about their own experiences and, and examples, practical examples that we thought you'd find interesting. And uh, as they go, they'll be picking up, uh, asking each other questions and picking out some of the questions that you're answering to. Um, as you'll ap appreciate, the speakers uh, will only be able to answer very general questions. So if you have a question about your own um, particular health disorder or, or, or concern or that of your child, please um, do go to your own doctor about it, our health team looking after it. Um, if we're not able to get through all the questions tonight, um, then please do feel, feel free to contact us after the event in the normal way. Um, the webinar also is being recorded, so if you do miss anything or would like to share it with um, any friends or family members who might find it useful, you'll be able to find a link to the recording in a few days' time or on our YouTube channel. So without any more from me, I'll hand you over to our speakers uh, to start the discussion. Thank you. James, I'm going to pick on you straight away, that's okay. Um, and I guess in some respects, uh, a logical place to start would be uh, with congenital hypothyroidism, because I guess that's in, in, in the main, it's, it's the youngest group of children with thyroid problems. And, and I was wondering, what, what, what are your key messages for the parents of a newly born child with congenital hypothyroidism? Um, and I mean, I, I know there's one or two questions already um, uh, emerging on the chat, which are uh, discussing congenital hypothyroidism, congenital hypothyroidism as well. So as I say, it might be a bad place to start. Thanks, Tim. I, I think it's a really you know, important area to think about. And I, I guess there's a lot that we know about it 
Um, there's a lot that we're still learning about. Um, so for the vast majority of our children with congenital hypothyroidism, we're talking about children whose thyroid gland itself isn't working rather than the brain parts that control the thyroid gland. And most, and most of those will be picked up on screening. So since we've had the introduction of screening, um, which is part of the newborn baby screen that most babies will have um, in that first week of life, um, we know that we're going to pick up the vast majority of these cases and then for we can start treatment really early. So we're, we're looking to start treatment there within the first couple of weeks. And the importance of that is that that thyroid hormone is so important for the developing brain and for developing growth in those first in those early years. So by starting thyroid treatments really early, we know and having followed up, you know, studies that followed up these children over long periods, that actually um, they go on to do normally compared to their peers without congenital hypothyroidism. So that's looking at sort of IQ tests and growth parameters. So I guess for me, the one of the first key messages is that this is a treatable condition um, and that if we get you on that medication early with the monitoring that we need um, and you're taking that treatment, that we can um, give you a normal um, growth patterns and normal development um, and so that your child should um, do as well as their peers without congenital hypothyroidism. I think that's a really important place to start. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you because um, I think it's fair to say, isn't it, James, that some of the older studies, perhaps when babies weren't managed so carefully, had um, slightly, um, let's say that the longer term outcome wasn't always um, optimal. And people used to talk about impaired quality of life and um, impact, for example, on, um, on longer term behaviours. But um, exactly as you said, I'm, I'm thinking particularly about um, the study from Germany, which, is, which was um, um, published relatively recently, which exactly as you said, highlighted that um, with close monitoring, appropriate doses of thyroxine, these young people not only uh, developed normally, but they also had uh, quality of life scores that were no different to their siblings as well and so certainly when I see uh, families in the initial phase I tend to quote that paper which is really very much in keeping with what you said and I think it's important isn't it for families to realize that um, some of the less positive stories about congenital hypothyroidism come from an era when perhaps babies weren't managed quite as closely um, do you think that's that that's that's probably the case? I think that's fair. And of course, the other thing that's happened over the last, I guess, 10 years or so is that the threshold where we say, actually, let's go and look at that child more closely. Let's see if there's a um, congenital hypothyroidism there has has fallen on the um, on the screening tests. And so we're picking up those milder cases as well in that in that early period. Um, and then again, hopefully offering those treatments um, from, from from an early age. Um, there's actually a question come up, uh, James. The first question, and um, and it's a, I think it's a really um, highly pertinent one, linking in with what we're saying, and also I think one or two of the other topics that we we thought might crop up tonight. Um, it's a question from a lady called Susie. Um, my son has congenital hypothyroidism, um, absent thyroid gland, so thyroid agenesis, who was diagnosed with ADHD at eight years of age. He's now almost ten. He struggles with attention focus at school particularly when his thyroxine dose is out of range. Should children with thyroid disorders be allowed additional time to take exams, et cetera? And are there any official guidelines regarding this? This is an interesting, interesting area, isn't it, James? Uh, absolutely. And I think, you know, like we said, there's, the interesting thing with the thyroid is that it, it feels like it can be fairly straightforward, I think, from a clinician's point of view. But when actually, as soon as, like with many other things, if you ask why a few times, you get to a point where we're not always, not always sure of exactly the answer and you get to a grey area. And I think that's really important to acknowledge and just say, actually, we don't know all the answers. I think, you know, the exam question is, is, is an interesting one. I think if it's, an, so if it's a new diagnosis where you're still in that unstable period and things are settling down. And again, the question sort of alludes to this about whether there are, you know, whether thyroxine is out of range. So when you're in that period of instability, for whatever reason that might be, um, then you, I think that there's a, a, a reasonable question about how that affects um, exam performance. 
equally, you know, the um, studies, certainly in adults and, and, and some in children as well, suggesting that actually, if you manage to get good biochemical control, you should see a quality of life, and including in sort of performance and um, behaviours, in a way that's similar to that seen in children, you know, with, with, without. And of course, one of the difficulties of thyroid disorders in general is that a lot of those signs and symptoms are really common in children without thyroid disorder. So yes. attention, yeah. headaches, tiredness, you know, in, in the teenagers as well. And so trying to tease out what's due to the underlying thyroid disorder and what's due to either other conditions, say Susie talks about her child having ADHD, um, or what's due to um, the way that teenagers feel, um, appreciating her child's a little bit younger than that, um, is, can be really difficult for clinicians. And so I think having that sort of open discussion um, is really important and open on both sides that the clinician accepts that there's some question there and, and from the parent point of view that it's not necessarily always down to the thyroid disorder. I don't know, does that sound like what you would say in clinic as well? Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. And I think um, I think some of the points you've made are highly relevant here. We, you know, we don't have all the answers. Um, and I, but I think there are some situations where it's very clear cut, isn't it, that the young person, uh, young person's learning may have been affected by the thyroid problem. And that, for me, the, one of the best examples is, um, is an overactive thyroid gland, Gray's disease where we know quite clearly that it's very hard to concentrate, uh, to focus in the normal way uh, when, you're, um, when, when you're at school. And clearly, if you, for example, have uh, developed hyperthyroidism, which has often been going on for quite a while before the diagnosis is made in the year leading up to GCSEs, then I think it's, it's, it's entirely appropriate to, um, to write a supportive letter because um, it, it's, it's very hard, I guess, to be um, uh, focusing in a normal way when you've got very, very high circulating uh, T3 levels. I think it, it gets more difficult if the Graves was diagnosed three or four years ago, and if, uh, the, I guess, the biochemical control has been pretty good. Um, and, you know, and I guess, ultimately, you you want to present the exam board with facts. And as you said, it's, it's, there's sometimes unknowns, aren't there really? It's like in the case of ADHD, you don't know, well, most, most motion people with ADHD, um, I guess, don't have a thyroid problem. And I guess some children will just, you know, by a, a bit of bad luck, have, have two problems, won't they? And they're not necessarily related, are they? Although they might be. And it's a, in a, I guess we, we often, we, we don't always know, do we? No, I, I, absolutely. I, I think that's completely right. Um, so I, I hope that's helpful, Susie, in in the sort of at least having the thoughts about those those discussions and about how that how that um, sort of ties in with exam performance and and it's variable. I guess it, it changes over time. Um, we we know that your thyroid hormone requirements are going to change. So particularly in periods of growth um, and through puberty, for instance. So that those early years and then again in puberty, you might need to have slightly more frequent contact, slightly more um, careful monitoring to make sure that that dose is staying on, 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 on top and is, is optimal um, for your child. There's another question actually, James, which I think is quite an interesting one, which is um, uh, what is the general recommendation when a child is diagnosed with an underactive thyroid? Um, should they be under a specialist or um, a paediatrician or just a GP? Have you got any thoughts about that? So, I mean, I, I guess I start off with what we what we do locally, and then I'll give you some of the reasons behind it. So, say so we're in Nottingham, um, we would generally recommend that all children with thyroid disorders are seen by a specialist paediatrician. Um, so that would be a paediatrician with an interest in endocrinology. Um, the reason for that is, is I say that your thyroid hormone is so important for your growth. Um, and so actually managing to monitor that as you're going through those periods of growth is important. Um, and having someone with a specialist interest, again, who understands the uh, sort of the biochemical pathways um, behind the thyroid disorders, who um, will confirm that the diagnosis is, um, for instance, in those ch in sort of two old children outside of the congenital age, likely to be autoimmune hypothyroidism, just um, keeping a wider diagnosis and aware of other alternatives. Um, so I think for those two reasons, for the differential and then for that close monitoring through periods of growth, it's really important. Um, and then I, I'll let you come back on that and then we'll maybe have a think about 
how long they stay under that paediatrician because I think that's another sort of follow-on question from there. Yeah, I was I was thinking, James, that uh, and I guess I've, I've wrote a bit about this quite recently. Uh, um, the fact that, um, uh, for example, children with congenital hyperthyroidism used to be dotted around in uh, non-specialist clinics. So a general paediatrician might have one patient on their books with a thyroid problem. And clearly, if you just look after one patient, you you are not going to get really very skilled in that particular area. And I think one of the things that um, the organisation we're linked to, the BSBED, and indeed the British Thyroid Foundation have highlighted is the importance of children, for example, with congenital hyperthyroidism being looked after by somebody who doesn't just look after one patient, who looks after quite a lot of them, because that way you get really good at it. And you know, um, if I can use the word, you know what the banana skins are? Because there are some banana skins for doctors, aren't there really? Absolutely. Um, I was thinking, you know, James, that one of the things that's, that's cropped up again is, is how you measure thyroid function. And I thought I'd, I'd you know, take the liberty of mentioning what, what um, and I think you, you and I have talked about this in the past, past I mentioned it. One of the things that, um, should we say, the non-specialist can, can get wrong is when managing patients who've got central hypothyroidism, so patients who, who aren't making TSH. And, and um, I think a number of the questions that I've seen have, have li been um, linked to um, what should be measured. And clearly, in the context of children who've got a problem with their pituitary gland, we, 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 we know that uh, TSH, which is what the GP is often most interested in, is pretty useless. And in those situations, you really do have to be measuring free T4 and looking ideally for a free T4 in the, in the top part of the reference range. But we are, I still see uh, children whose dose of thyroxine has been reduced because they've had a low TSH and the GP has thought they've been on too much medication as a result. So I guess it's just an illustration really of what you are saying, which is that you know you 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 need to be seeing somebody who's aware and of the, the nuances of good practice, good practice. And I think that, that leads on really nicely to thinking about those sort of those thyroid function tests and what we measure and why we measure it. So like you said, if you go to your GP and ask for a thyroid function test, what the lab will do at your local hospital is likely to be a TSH. So your TSH, as you said, is secreted from the brain um, and controls your thyroid hormone levels. Um, and for the vast majority of us, you, if your TSH is normal, your T3 and T4 are likely to be normal. And that's due to the relationship between them. So if your T3 and T4 goes out of range slightly, your TSH will shift significantly further for, for the same change. Um, so your TSH is a pretty good measure for the vast majority of people. And if it's normal, then your T3 and T4 are likely to be normal. And then that's sort of then often in our specialist clinics, we look at those other, so those thyroid hormones. Um, and because I'm a simple person, we'll call them T3 and T4. Um, so T4 is the one that's mostly in your blood um, and goes down to if you, if you piled it up, you'd have a lot more T4 than you have your T3. Um, but your T3 is the one that actually works in your cells. And so there are, we've got a few questions about sort of T3. Why is T3 not checked? And uh, I think there's problems converting um, T4, so or levothyroxine to T3. And, and I think there's a lot in their literature, particularly in the US literature, about using T3, about measuring T3. And I think it is an important part of what we look at. I guess the caution is that a lot of that conversion happens in the cells. So individual cells can convert your T4 to T3 to keep the levels that they need of their local thyroid environment. Um, and so yes, measuring blood T3 is useful, but it doesn't necessarily tell you what's going on at the cellular level, um, which, is, uh, which is far more complicated and actually far more relevant to how you're feeling and your symptoms potentially. So I think TSH, say if you go to your GP, you'll get that measured. And if that's normal, um, then that's likely to be a reassuring sign. I would certainly always measure T4 alongside that because um, like you say, we know we've seen the banana skins, we, 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 we want those uh, things. And also when we're seeing patients, we've got symptoms to go with it. Um, and then actually locally in Nottingham, we do tend to measure T3 fairly routinely as part of our thyroid function test because it does give you that element of that bioactive um, sort of uh, supercharged um, element of the thyroid hormones and, um, and, and, and can also give you some clues, I'd like to say, as to what's going on underneath, um, what the disease process might be um, and, and those sorts of things. It's, uh, that's really helpful, James. I, the, one of the other questions is what's the highest TSH I've ever seen? And I've certainly seen one in the several hundreds, um, typically in, well, actually in a baby with congenital hypothyroidism, but also 
in someone with acquired hypothyroidism as well. So in other words, a thyroid gland that's been beaten up by autoantibodies. Um, and it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because um, uh, we know that long-standing hypothyroidism in children can, can actually give rise to um, some quite significant problems, can't it, James? I was thinking about the, I mean, we don't see it very, very often and clearly you wouldn't expect to see these problems in somebody who had a TSH, say, of six, seven or eight. But certainly if someone had a TSH of 678, then you're into the realms of these rare things like, I was thinking of things like um, like the hip problems, like capital femoral epiphysis. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you've ever seen that, uh, James, in, in youngsters. No, I've never seen it. Uh, no. I think I've seen studies of it and that's, it's, it's interesting your lab obviously does more dilution than our lab because I was just say it's over 150 and once you oh, right. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah right yeah 150 which yeah. I think ties into that point so again for sort of thinking about it so um, a normal TSH is roughly between a half and four and a half yeah. um, and so once you're into realms of over 150 then I guess you can argue whether it's important whether it's 151 or um, 800 yeah. Um, but yeah and I, I guess it links in with one of the other questions as well was that uh, the, this issue of um, thyroid function puberty and another thing this very high TSH level can can do and people may read about this in in, in the textbooks I mean you don't see it very often is is this is this is the fact that a very high TSH can actually actually stimulate the ovaries and cause a bit of bus development yeah. Um, and, uh, and that's something that, that we learn about, isn't it, as, as, as doctors, is to, you know, if, if somebody's going into puberty early, always check their thyroid function. Um, it's, I think that's fair to say, isn't it, James? No, uh, absolutely. So, as I say, these are the sort of the details that you need to be aware of if you're seeing children regularly with hormone problems that you potentially would sort of, it's in the smaller print, um, but it's really important not to be missing. There's another question about can head injuries cause thyroid problems in children? Would you like to, to would you like to bat that one, James? I, I'm, I'm trying to think if I've ever seen, I've, I've ever seen, I don't know if you've got experience. I, I mean, I guess my thought would only be through the pituitary axis, so yeah. more central damage yeah. um, rather than damage directly to the thyroid. Now, I guess the other thing to bear in mind here is in the transient sense. So we know that when you're sick, your body responds by basically suppressing all of your thyroid hormones, so suppressing your metabolic state. So when we see children coming into, and children who are pretty sick, so we're talking sort of intensive care, potentially needing tubes to help them breathe, needing medicines to keep their blood pressure up, that sort of sick, um, that actually your thyroid function can look very abnormal. And unless you have a really good like, suspicion that the underlying cause of this was a thyroid problem, that it's probably not very helpful to check it. And I certainly get, one or two emails a week saying we check thyroid function in this child who's really really sick and it looks a bit odd what should we be doing do they have central hypothyroidism is often the question because everything's just suppressed and the answer is usually no and um, go ahead so that i guess those would be my two thoughts if you're really unwell with your head injury then potentially you might get what we call it so it's called a, a sick thyroid syndrome um or have you damaged the part of your brain that's controlling your thyroid hormones I, I think that's that actually is, is a really, really good point, isn't it? And just to hopefully it's not making things too complicated, but I guess what you're saying is that funny thyroid function tests can be a consequence of somebody being poorly. And I guess whenever you see slightly unusual thyroid function tests in a child, I suppose we always have to ask ourselves, is this a consequence of some other illness? Um, and I guess, you know, obviously an extreme example would be, um, let's think about, well, what, I suppose one example actually, it's not a bad example, is that sometimes people who are on the heavy side can have a slightly raised, raised TSH. And you'd easily say, aha, the raised TSH is the cause of this person being heavy. When in reality, we know it's the other way around in certainly, in a, not always, because, you know, the, the, you can never say never, but in a lot of heavier people, they've become heavy and the TSH has gone up as a result. Is that something that you see sometimes, James? Absolutely, I think, um, I guess, I, yes, I've got two thoughts. I went looking for the evidence and, you know, there's not always answers in the evidence, but, you know, let's see what the best is that we can find about low TSH causing weight gain. And the evidence in the literature is actually fairly minimal outside of really quite extreme examples. So I always, I'm, I'm cautious. And again, like, like you and I've talked about before, I never say never. Absolutely. And I know, you know, spoken to patients who can 
uh, to relate their thyroid functions to how they feel in themselves or how they're weight gaining things. But certainly when you try and look at trials, it, it, the evidence is minimal. So I'm, I'm cautious about attributing thyroid to, it, to, to, to weight. Um, and I think this sort of leads on to thinking about those, those group of what we might call subclinical hypothyroidism. So this is where your TSH is starting to go up a bit. Um, and so I, I, I sort of think about that as the brain needing to shout a little bit louder at the, at the thyroid gland to try and wake it up and keep it going. So your TSH has gone up, but actually your thyroid hormones are okay. So maybe your, you know, maybe your thyroid gland is um, needing to work a little bit harder, but actually or the brain's having to work a bit harder to keep it going, but actually it's, it's able to keep up to the job. Um, so this is maybe how the NHS feels, I think, some, on, on, on some days. <laughs> we're working a little bit harder, but, but we're still hopefully uh, managing to do the job. Um, and then uh, those are a really interesting group and they can be a really difficult group, I think, to know what do we do with, what do we do? You know, do you start them on levothyroxine? And again, I know there were questions about, okay, so the TSH is up a bit, shouldn't I be on levothyroxine? Um, and why not, I guess, is, 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 is one of the questions. Um, I, I think thinking about that subclinical group, um, obesity would be one group in there. So in that child where that TSH is just pushing up a little bit, the thyroid hormones are probably normal still, um, then we know that um, being overweight will likely to sort of can create that picture. And again, it's that not assuming that everything's down to that, but equally sort of having that open mind that that, that element could, could, could be part of it. Um, I guess thinking about other causes, so certainly in those groups, I would want to look at autoimmune. So this is in a child who hasn't got congenital hypothyroidism. We're talking sort of you know uh, mid childhood or something typically. So what are their auto antibodies? So if they've got signs that they've got that they have antibodies that are attacking their thyroid gland, then it's uh, then we know that you're at a higher risk of um, going on and developing uh, full blown hypothyroidism typically. What I can't tell you then is is when, um, or or even necessarily, if, but but certainly when. Um, and so, do you check every week, looking for that moment where it tips, or do you check when they're symptomatic? And I think you know, I would typically say for those groups that we might be checking every six to twelve months, unless they develop new symptoms, in which case I might ask them to check earlier. Um, and 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 for most places, and there is a bit of discussion around this. For most places look at a threshold of, of 10 as being the point where you start to think actually we probably need to even with normal thyroid hormones that that pituitary gland is having to work a little bit too hard to keep going um and that may be starting to have sort of symptoms um but it's um but it's certainly one that's again part of that discussion that i'd have with patients looking at symptoms thinking what's realistically likely to be to that thyroid hormone and and how much and, and for those who stay in the normal range probably repeating in sort of six to twelve months um, th again, does that sound like sort of part of your practice, Tim? And I know that, I mean, there are a whole group of congenital, of the, sorry, of subclinical hypothyroidism, and it's really a, really quite a complex area. Yeah, I, I guess I, uh, adding to what you've been saying, I think that um, it's easy to remember, easy to forget sometimes. I feel, feel it, um, sometimes I think it's easy to forget that it's not me who has to take the tablets, it's the young person. And, you know, you've, it's very much, I guess, personalised medicine, isn't it? Dealing with each case um, as it as 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 a unique scenario, and um, and I think explaining to the young person that if you have a TSH that's seven or eight, then uh, it's very easy for doctors to treat numbers, and um, and um, we just have to be a little bit wary about giving a medicine that somebody is then going to receive from the GP for the rest of their, their life. Um, we really need to make sure the young person understands what it is that they're letting themselves in for. Now, I'll, I'll give you an example. There's an old man called Tim Cheatham who's in this call today. Now, the old man, Tim Cheatham, had a, uh, we kept on falling asleep in front of the telly. And um, I had my thyroid function checked and I had a TSH of seven. And I had a low, uh, I had a, a raised thyroproxase antibody titer. It wasn't very high, but it was mildly raised. And so it'd been very, very easy for me to treat myself with thyroxine then. And I, indeed, I, I spoke to a health professional about this. But, I, you know, I wasn't really that keen on taking tablets. I, was, I just want to see what happens. 
And lo and behold, um, I, my TSH normalized and the antibodies started to fall. This is after several months. But I started falling asleep in front of the telly even more. So if you like, it was teaching me that me or my wife always said that me sleeping, uh, falling asleep, asleep in front of the telly was something to do with getting up at half past five in the morning. It was nothing to do with my thyroid. And it, it, so it, it taught me that I suppose that, that you have to look serially before you understand the natural history of a, of a condition. And in this instance, you know, sure, you can get antibodies, but not, maybe not that often, but sometimes the antibodies can go away. And I, when I'm seeing young people, I explain... This. I say, well, you know, when you take thyroxine, you might not necessarily feel any different. Um, and you need to know that. And I often show young people the screen showing the TSH levels so that they are, um, uh, are let's say, they understand my thinking before they start taking thyroxine. No disrespect to parents who are phoning in today, but ultimately it's not me or it's not mum and dad that have to take this. And I think making sure that the young person understands that with that it's it, a trial of treatment can sometimes be quite useful but um i'm very wary about um then discharging an individual who's had a very subtle increase in tsh of discharging them to the gp without potentially having a trial of treatment thinking of me and as somebody who had abnormal thyroid function that then normalized what yeah, do you I think, think about that, James? No, I, I think that's really important. So absolutely. So we know that a proportion of these children or children who have borderline raised TSH levels, normal thyroid hormone levels, actually, as you say, if you follow them up, they'll normalize. So if you put all of those children immediately on levothyroxine, like you say, you're sort of committing them for the majority of people for lifelong treatment. Now, someone may at some point say, well, let's see what you like off it. And I would look, actually, you're fine. But for a lot of them, once you're on that pathway, you then you then continue on it. So I think it is really important to look at that, um, look for that evidence of that transient. And like you say, some of those patients will um, have then completely normalised. And you're sort of talking a couple of months, I guess, somewhere between four and twelve weeks might be a reasonable time. So around eight weeks, I would probably suggest to recheck it. And or some of them will then become overtly hypothyroid, and then you can um, start treatment again with that commitment that you're actually doing good for that patient in, in the long run. Um, and then I guess the third group will just carry on tracking along with a slightly raised TSH and slightly um, high antibodies. Um, and, and, and then those ones, um, again, typically I, I would suggest following up sort of every six months or so just to keep an eye on unless, unless symptoms develop sooner. Yeah. Yeah, I think ultimately making sure, I suppose, that um, young people understand and that if they go into a trial of thyroxine with a subtle increase in TSH levels, that they know that this is um, a quite a contentious area and there's advantages and disadvantages of treating. And I think giving people the opportunity to, uh, to embark on a trial of thyroxine is, is entirely reasonable. But um, I, I think people uh, need to know that, um, uh, that just because you start a medicine doesn't automatically mean that um, a trial off treatment at a later stage is off limits. I mean, clearly, if you have it started off with a TSH that's rampantly high, that this is probably a thyroid problem that's not going to go away. There's another question here, James, that um, talk about iron and thyroid function. What would you, you know, it could, I, I guess, it, it, I don't know whether this is linking in with, with, with when you take thyroxine uh, foodstuffs that you should avoid when you take medication. What do you talk to your families about when, uh, um, when they when you're starting thyroxine treatment so I guess um, the, my thoughts about the connection between iron and thyroid is normally that they're both picked up because someone's come in and said I feel really tired so right. you probably checked a full blood count and iron and a thyroid function um, would be two of the sort of standard tests and they're both relatively common things iron deficiency we know is very common um, and hypothyroidism is, is, is relatively common um, then the second part of the connection is that when you treat the iron, the iron and the thyroid hormone uh, treatment uh, can interact. And so you do need to separate those out um, by, by a few hours. Um, but those would be my, my, my two main thoughts about yeah. that, the, the connection there. There's another question here about, um, about uh, someone, a patient with a young, young lady with Hashimoto's disease. Um, and it's this, 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 this issue again about, I suppose, about symptoms. And um, I, I, 
don't know about you, James, but um, whenever I see somebody who's had a slightly raised TSH or a abnormal thyroid function test and they have symptoms of tiredness, I always think it's import important to keep an open mind because I'm sure you and I have, have seen patients who where everything, the poor old thyroid's been blamed for everything. Yeah. And lo and behold, you find something else. For example, you find that there's maybe celiac disease or maybe you find that um, you know, that there's iodine deficiency, or maybe you find that there's vitamin D deficiency. So I guess, I suppose, you know, it, when you're, when, in addition to uh, th thyroid, um, thyroid function tests, if you have tiredness, is, are there any kind of general thoughts you have about things that parents should be thinking about? I guess. That's so, a bit so of a hard, I'm, that's I'm, a hard one, isn't no, it? It's, so I, I, I think this, I'm going to argue against myself for now in two halves. It's a, it's, a, it's a skill. The first thing is that we know if you take everyone's thyroid hormone test across the country, um, which is obviously has been done, and we say, right, we know what the average is, we know what's high, we know what's low, we know what in between, what we're ranges that we're happy to say this is normal. So that works if you want to look at lots of different people. But actually, we also know that if I check yours repeatedly, as you have done, or if I check mine, you know, every day for, for a couple of years, um, that I would probably maintain mine a lot tighter than the population does as a whole. So on one side, I'm going to say you can have normal, quote, normal thyroid function tests that may not be normal for that patient. And so they can be symptomatic within the normal range. So I keep an open mind on that side. And then absolutely on the other side is this, well, you've got hypothyroidism. So every symptom and because the symptoms are so varied and and can be vague and can be non-specific it is very easy as you say to say right well the tiredness must be a thyroid function so actually you know hopefully you've been seeing these seeing patients over time so you've got that those serial measurements they hopefully know when they feel right and when they don't and actually if their biochemistry is looking uh, good then absolutely keeping that open mind what well, is there anything else going on so you know again picking on the poor teenagers um, we, we, we um, older people create this society which says, right, let's all get up yourself, you know, at half five in the morning and we'll start work at nine at the latest. And we'll do that to, to you guys as well. So you've got to be in school at half eight. Um, but actually, we know that your body clock saying, you go to bed at 11 o'clock and maybe stay up, up till about two in the morning. Um, but then you can have a lie in, except you can't. And so I had a beautiful description of it. It's basically like being jet lagged, being stuck in the mid Atlantic, jet lagged, you know. Uh, so working on mid-Atlantic time and, and being and, and growing up in London, um, so so you, you feel tired and lethargic and rubbish a lot of the time, and it's really you know it's our fault for having forced them into this pattern of, of getting up and going to bed that suits us and doesn't necessarily suit those teen, suit teenagers. So some of it can be that, and I think teasing out what's normal for that age and what's you know abnormal is helpful. And then absolutely, so I think you know. We certainly sat through enough conferences where people talk about growth hormone and thyroid hormone and say, actually, the first part of it is being a general pediatrician. And we're all trained in being general pediatricians and then specializing in endocrinology. And so keeping that general pediatric hat on is really important. So as you say, are there gastro problems? Are there you know, celiac disease? Is there underlying health problems? Is there iron deficiency? Um, vitamin D deficiency is another talk, you know, for another day. Um, so a whole range of a whole range of things and try and spot whether there are any red flags as well that make you think actually this is something a bit abnormal and we need to look harder. I think it's really important. There's been another question, James, about the timing of medication when you should give um, thyroxine. Do, do you have any thoughts about that when you're discussing this with, with families? Because I, I guess we know there's certain things, aren't there, which can affect the way the thyroxine is absorbed to a major degree. I, was, I think the one I always remember is soya. Um, do you have any recommendations when you see someone with a thyroid problem and they're started on thyroxine? What, what would do you say about timing? So I think my number one rule is that the timing is, so consistency is good. Um, consistency is good because if we build habits, then we're much more likely to take it. So I think my number one rule is the best time is the time when you're going to take it. Now, if that's next to your toothbrush in the morning, uh, that's great and if that's you know in the evening at the same time as you're reading your book then then I'll, I'll take that as well so I think the first thing is doing it at the time of the day that you're most likely to take it every day um, and then if you want to look at ideals I think in adults largely they talk about um, not giving it with food generally in pediatrics that's not something that we you know routine advice and certainly our young ones would often take it with a bottle or with with a bit of a feed so um it, that's not so much an element. I think avoiding the soya is important um, and avoiding um, iron, again, if you're on that, is, is important. Um, 
I, th I know some people will say take it in the morning, um, sort of thinking about the biochemical profile and things um, and trying to match what your natural body is. And, and, and I don't know if that's something you, you prescribe to. I'd, if you were going to, I'd rather you took it in the evening consistently than took it in the morning um, and missed it sometimes, I guess. Yeah, I think those are very wise, wise words, James. And I suppose the thing I always think about as well is that um, although, I mean, soya can affect absorption to a major degree, but if you're giving it with a bottle, that might have a tiny effect on absorption. But presumably if you take it as you suggested the same, in the same way each day, then the blood tests will reflect that pattern. And if you need a little bit more thyroxin, then the, um, as I say, that um, because the absorption is affected to a, to a, a small degree, then lo and behold, uh, that will be reflected in the advice you then get about um, about the, the dose between now and the next appointment, yeah. if that makes sense. Absolutely. So, um, so, so, but the, the, so yeah, the, I, I think there's a general, yeah, I think you're, you know, very wise words. It is, it's, it's, uh, it's taking it at the most uh, convenient time, time of the day. And I guess that's particularly true, isn't it, of, um, of teenagers who, um, maybe aren't quite as good at remembering as as say the parents of a, of a of a newborn baby with congenital hypothyroidism do you have any other top tips for helping teenagers take their medicines oh um top tips um i, I don't think i do come on you must have some james i i, I what, what else do you what, what do you say so i guess i guess the other thing that i i sometimes throw in is, is i'm a big fan of the bill pill boxes um and, yeah. and, and the reason is then you know whether it's gone in or not so actually you can leave right. your teenager to take their medicine uh in the morning let's say and you can have a look when they've gone to school and if the pill is still in the box you can remind them when they get home um, okay it's not ideal but you know it'd be great if it was at the same time every day but actually then you know what's gone in you know what's not gone in um and actually i do allow our teenagers even to if they know spot the second day that they've not given a dose to take a double dose the following day um, which I think, again, may vary a little bit between people. But again, we found that gives better control overall. There's another question here, James, which is I think is uh, quite interesting. Um, my son is, a, is on a dose of 75 micrograms of levothyroxine Monday to Thursday and 100 micrograms Friday to Sunday. Um, so that in itself raises questions about different doses on different days of the week. Um, He's just turned six. He has increased anxiety, clinginess since he has had a dose increase. Is this normal? Would you? What would you? How would you? How would you manage that? So, I mean, I think yeah. So, so, so different doses across the week. I guess we do have patients with similar regimes. Um, again, it's you know you, you've tried seventy-five and it's not quite enough, and you've tried a hundred and it's a bit too much. Um, and so then trying to sort of get somewhere between the two, um, it's, it's a fairly, it's fairly long acting. And again, it, it, it generally seems to work fairly well. Um, again, I think it sort of comes back to that open mind that we've sort of, I think we're sounding, hoping not sound too much like a broken record, but it is that open mind. So, okay, let's have a, have a look. Is that dose suiting him? Um, is it the right dose? Um, and again, so then that may be checking the thyroid function and you probably probably want to leave it a, at least a few weeks to sort of let things settle back down otherwise you're not going to see that change um and then if it is then you know what else is going on at, at the same time so whether that might be around school or other things at home you know um certainly a lot of young children have a whole load of anxiety certainly that we've seen in clinics around you know that this has been a, a very funny time to over the last couple of years to have your um early years and i've got you know i've got kids myself from sort of 12 down to seven and, and, and they've all sort of got anxiety, not anxiety necessarily, but sort of concerns and things ab about it because you suddenly realise that that's a very abnormal childhood to have spent sort of two or three years of your life in. So there's, again, I think it's about that open mind about um, just trying to think about, um, is it thyroid? You know, have you got good evidence that actually a change would help? Um, and then if not, keeping an open mind about other things. Um, and I guess having to speak to your clinician would be the other thing and say, actually, it seems to not be, if, you know, if you feel it seems to not be working, would it be reasonable to go back to your previous dose and see if things suddenly get better um, and have a little bit of a trial? And there may be good reasons not to do that as again, you know, certainly don't want to be um, advising on, you know, having not got all, the, in, in, got all the information, but it would be a reasonable question to say, actually, could I, you know, could I go back and try it and see how he settles down and, and we can check the thyroid function a little bit. Yeah. Okay. There's uh, some questions about um, about um, a 
young lady who's had a thyroidectomy and feels um uh well the question is can it can can um thyroid problems give make you feel sick after certain foods um and again i don't know about you james but i suppose i'd, I'd be thinking in that situation if of uh, checking for other things i suppose really particularly if it, if it was graves disease or somebody's mm -hmm. feeling sick because there's that association isn't there between uh, the autoimmune condition that is graves and other autoimmune conditions and again it's it, i guess I, I i don't think that if you're on a, an appropriate dose of thyroxine that you'd normally expect to feel sick um any gi symptoms provided thyroid function tests are okay i'd be wondering about i'd be discussing it with your pediatrician saying you know is there anything else going on here um and uh, i suspect uh, I suspect we've all, in some young people with autoimmune thyroid disease, found other things as well. So, again, that's uh, that's a, a very important reason for uh, discussing your concerns with your with 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 the paediatrician, I guess. Absolutely, and I guess it also, yeah, like you say here, it's Graves' disease for the thyroidectomy, and so like we know those autoimmune conditions do unfortunately come together. Um, I guess other people who may have had thyroidectomies for other reasons. Um, then there may be associations again. So I think it's some of the sort of the genetic conditions that we see that come together. Um, but, but, but yeah, absolutely here, looking for those other autoimmunes and again, looking for the other things that might be going on. There's um, an, a question about, we've not talked much, talked much about Graves' disease. I'm just aware there's, there's um, uh, times moving on. Um, my 16 year old daughter was diagnosed with Graves three years ago. It's about to trial coming off her carbimazole when the exams finish although her antibodies are still a little high, just wondering what to look out for over the next few months as to how our body is coping and what the chance of success might be. So there's a good one for you, James. For me, <laughs> I, I'm not sure I can talk. I feel uh, an imposter talking to you about Graves' disease, Tim. <laughs> um, so go on, I'll, I'll start and then you can, um, you, you, you can pick it up. Um, so I think, yeah, this is one of these areas. So we started off saying, didn't we, that there's things that we know and we're learning all the time and actually being honest that there are things that we're still learning about. And I think Graves' disease is probably one of those things where there's actually a lot of work still to be done. A lot of questions about how long should you be on carbimazole for? Um, do, you, how, do you get more benefit if you're on for longer? And how much more benefit do you get on if you're on for even longer? Um, and, and, and thinking about treatments as well. So um we know that typically this is a different antibody to what we usually see in children who've got low thyroid disorders um and that antibody will usually stimulate the thyroid gland make it produce um thyroid hormone out of um out of control um and um but it can also just to be confusing um block the thyroid gland um and you can move from one to the other and we can't tell the difference in a standard lab test between the antibody that's blocking it and the antibody that's that's stimulating it um so all of that just to sort of throw in there um so after you've had graves disease you may um stop your treatment and then be fine and probably depending on how long you continue in the studies how long they sort of carried on looking at people will change that number of how and what percentage you think will be fine um some will carry on and have another an episode of high thyroid levels um, and then I think a lot of people might start having conversations about saying well this is likely to come and to come back um, recurrently and do we need to think about ways of turning the thyroid gland off and some people may end up with a, a low thyroid gland. Um, so as far as the question there about what to look out for over the coming months I think again this question of again without knowing the numbers or the sort of the details if you've still got those antibodies around um, then are you maybe slightly more likely than someone without those antibodies to have another episode? And I think my experience, I'll be really interested in yours, my experience is that, being that those symptoms are obviously are often very similar to the symptoms that they had the first time round and maybe didn't recognise what they were for a while because that's quite common. Um, but certainly patients I've seen relapse that you know, I was getting, and although the group of symptoms when you ask patients with grave disease altogether is quite wide, quite often they're tuned into now to actually this you know they started being anxious or um, they started having heart racing again or they've noticed the handwriting's got a bit shaky and and, and it will vary between people or it might be mum saying their necks sort of looks a bit swollen again or their eyes went funny a whole load of different things but my experience has been quite often they come back to what they've first presented with um, I'm sure that's not 
cast iron, but it's sort of, that's, that's been my clinical experience. Yeah, I think the it's it's quite a contentious subject, isn't it? As how long to treat for, and I think that um, um, you and I, James, we're aware of of um, studies that um, have suggested that well, maybe we should be treating young people for longer, um, because there is some evidence, not maybe the best evidence, but some evidence suggests that the longer you treat, the more likely you are to remit. And so the advocates of lengthy treatment would say, well, you know, there's no harm in stopping every now and again. People know what science look out for. Um, if we're going to stop, then generally we would, I think people would only do so if the fight there was, you know, the antibodies you talk about, the fight was set to antibodies, if the titer was low. Um, and, you know, if, if you were monitoring people carefully, then you'll pick up the return of the overactivity sooner rather than later. And so there is a, a there is a school of thought that treating people for a number of years is entirely, entirely reasonable. I think, as I say, I don't think people would generally stop and um, suggest that people embark on a trial unless the thyroid receptor antibody titers are low. Um, of course, as you say, there are, people, there are people can also have these destructive antibodies as well, these thyroproxase antibodies, and um, but they aren't the ones that are primarily responsible for stimulating the gland. But I think that um, um, the way forward, the way people are thinking now, is that um, it would be really nice, for example, if we were able to know at baseline or early on who was going to relapse when the antithyroid drug, or who was going to, for example, who's going to remit when the antithyroid drug is stopped after two or three years. And that's an area where people are doing a lot of work at the moment. And I guess people are always look, also looking at, at new treatments besides carbimazole that maybe can make the immune system behave a bit better and stop attacking the thyroid gland. Um, so, yeah, yeah, are quite exciting times in, in Gray's disease. But um, I think that certainly it, it's that specific question about stopping the antithyroid drug, I think that it's probably not wise to stop the antithyroid drug if the thyroid receptor antibodies can still be measured in the bloodstream because the, the, the likelihood is that the condition is going to come back. Unfortunately, even if their antibodies are, are low, there's still, it's still likely that it's going to come back. People would say 60, 70, 80% chance, but um, I think it's almost certain to come back if the antibodies are, are present. Sorry, James. No, no, I was going to say, so, so I just, there's another question here which follows up nicely on that, I think. So they were talking about a son who's relapsed after two years off medication. Um, so he's back on his carbimazole again. And there's a question about him having, to, like we've talked about definitive treatment. People say, okay, are we going to turn the thyroid gland off permanently one way or another? Um, so, and then they, so their question there is, is it okay for him to have carbimazole for another two years until he's finished his A-levels? Um, I think you sort of touched on that, but I think it's, it's, it's a useful point just to emphasize. Yeah. The, there's, it, there's, there's not a lot of um, quality of life data out there, but because um, thinking about graves and, you know, because ultimately I don't think there's one treatment that's necessarily head and shoulders above the other. You know, if you're on antithyroid drug, you've got this holy grail of uh, remission off treatment, but we know that certainly in the short term, it's not very likely. Um, the beauty of, of surgery or in older young people radioiodine is that it gets rid of the problem uh, to, to, to a large degree, but of course you then need thyroxin replacement. So it's not really a cure, but one of the a small quality of life study that we did uh, of young people, uh, which perhaps is worth bearing in mind, is that those people who went on to have the thyroid removed or have radioiodine treatment, generally speaking, they didn't regret that. They, they that, that one of the messages that was coming through was, well, you know what? Um, I do wonder sometimes if we should have taken this route a bit earlier, but I guess they're, they're, I suppose you could argue maybe they're bound to, set to, to take that view. But um, I think for some young people, taking antithyroid drug, meaning lots of if it's an unstable thyroid function, is a real pain. And sometimes um, I have, you know, I've I've recommended to you know to families to young people, you know what, maybe the simplest way forwards, given all the ups and downs that you've had, would be to uh, would be to think about. Um, 
a de more definitive treatment with surgery or radioiodine, even though it means you'll be on thyroxine replacement in the long term. And, and I think that really touched on it because we, I think we both must have patients who um, can be really, really difficult to, whose thyroid function goes up, goes down, and you just can't quite seem to get that middle ground. And then they feel rubbish with that. Um, and conversely, some patients who are on a regular dose of carbimazole, it seems to hold them nicely in range. Um, and actually, they feel okay on that. So again, I don't think there's a right or a wrong answer. Um, I guess here, on, on, on this, there's no rush to go for definitive treatment. I think that's probably fair to say. Um, and so picking that time when it's a, 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 the right time for you is, is, is a reasonable thing to do. Would you, would yes, you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah, very, and it is. It comes down to this personalised medicine bit, doesn't it? Really, it's. Uh, uh, I think that um, clearly any successful um, strategy is going to be one that um, um, is decided not just by doctor and even doctor and parents, but doctor parents and young person as well. Indeed, they should probably be at the forefront. There's, a, there's an interesting question. It's getting away from Gray's disease, but I, I and it's and it's a bit small print. But I thought this is quite interesting for maybe for people. And I don't know whether you've ever seen this, James. Um, uh, my twelve-year-old has excelled in school. However, since having autoimmune thyroid disorder, her maths has been a real struggle. Her levels are within the range. Could it be linked to a thyroid? And and I don't know the specific background, but I I, I always remember and 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 well, well, I've seen this a few times. Is that young people who a profoundly hypothyroid, you know, when the TSH is that, you know, and your assay would be 150 plus. When they're diagnosed with hypothyroidism and started on thyroxine, sometimes, I guess, because perhaps because the brain has, has become used to periods of, of being relatively underactive, their school performance can go to pot. Have you ever seen that, James? I've, I've not seen, seen it. it. No, but. It, yeah, if, I think it's in the literature as well. Yeah. Um, and so I guess, you know, we always see thyrox, you know, the, these, so these fam families come and they think, you know, thank goodness you've diagnosed my child with, with hypothyroidism. But paradoxically, when you start these young people, and well, this is on, only on occasions on thyroxine, um, parents aren't quite so pleased anymore because uh, I guess because the human body is very um, good at adapting. And if you've had relatively low or very low, as is the case with these children, thyroid hormone levels for a long time, you sit at the back of the class and you tend to just to get on with things. And then suddenly this doctor gives you this thyroxine that you haven't seen for quite some time. And you're, you're, and I guess a bit, maybe it's a bit like the patient becoming overactive. It does impact on uh, school performance. So I suppose answering this specific question, I'd say that if it's subtle thyroid dysfunction, then you wouldn't usually expect um, going onto thyroxine uh, to have a major impact on performance in mathematics but if the if the thyroid function was was profoundly abnormal then yes i think that if you go on to thyroxine in and the uh, in the context of thyroid tests that were very abnormal you can not in the long term but for a while enter a phase where school paradoxically school performance actually deteriorates which is a funny thing this is why i always enjoy talking to you i can always learn <laughs> something and i think it, it demonstrates doesn't it they, i say this sort of perceived simplicity has so many um sort of nooks and crannies and details that that, that uh, and, and subtleties to it um there's going back to grace these there's a question here about i realize we're, we're the time's almost up but uh what do we know about what the long-term effects of being on carbimazole are what, what would you if somebody asked you that james what would you what would you say so I'm, I'm going to stick in one other bit about um, Graves' disease just before we finish, um, which I guess is just, I think, an, an important message, but hopefully I think clinicians would, would tell people. But if you're off, um, so even if you're off Graves' disease, particularly if you've had your thyroid gland turned off, whether it's with surgery or radioiodine, then just being aware, particularly as a woman, that um, you, if you're ever going to... It, if you're thinking of planning a family, it's really important um, to have those conversations about having been hyperthyroid um, because we know that those antibodies can uh, cross the placenta and, and, and sort of and, and can um, affect the baby. As if you've had your thyroid gland out in particular, then actually you might not know that they're still around. Um, and conversely, I think in all thyroid disorders, it's really important that pregnancies is planned and um, sort of thyroid function is as well controlled as possible. So I'm just going to chip that that bit in there um i'm thinking from from, from the long-term effects of carbimazole 
I'm not aware of a huge amount of data in children um, that looks at it. I think that it's generally fairly well tolerated. And we know about sort of the side effects um, that we warn people about, particularly around the risks if you have a sort of a sore throat or a fever of having your full blood count checked because it can affect those um, and occasionally liver function as well. Um, but those are the main things that I tend to pick up on when I'm talking yeah. about starting it. What I always remember, Red, I suppose, James, is that, um, and I guess this is this is the problem for me with carbimazole, is that if you're going to have any significant side effects, they usually happen early on. So if you got to a few months and you're on carbimazole and you've not had any side effects, you're probably going to be fine. But if it's Saturday night and you sat down and you're watching, just about to, to watch... Um, what is it you watch the Saturday night these days? I'm trying to think. Anyway, Strictly some come. problem? Let's go with Strictly Come Dancing. It's Strictly Come Dancing, okay. And then, then the young person on a, a dose of cobwebs or gets a sore throat. You still have to take that seriously, don't you, and go yeah. to the get the full blood count check. Because even though maybe you've been on treatment for many, many months and the likelihood of side effects is very, very small, there's still that remote possibility that you may um you may have developed a low 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 blood count but as a general rule i would say that cobimazole if, you know that most people tolerate it very well in the long term and yeah. um, particularly if you've tolerated it for the first few months few months you're unlikely to run into any significant problems with side effects in the long term yeah that's certainly been my experience more generally say. yeah before we be julia or um other team members from the, the BTF. Have you got any 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 other questions or the, or comments that you 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 think we should answer before we um, let people uh, relax and sit down in front of the telly? I think Still you're muted, muted, Julia. I think you're muted, Julia. Apologies for that. What one final question we could pick up from the end? Um, if uh, there's, there's a, a mum saying that her 11 year old daughter has got Hashimoto's how likely is it that the sibling might also have a thyroid problem? James. I was just going to say Tim. <laughs> um, there's not a strong, so with all autoimmune conditions, there is um, some genetic markers that sort of make you more likely to develop uh, autoimmune conditions. Um, so I say it's not a question I've looked into in detail. I, I, I think um, you would be more, uh, slightly more likely, but certainly by no means a guarantee. Um, and so I would be looking for symptoms. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be screening siblings um, purely because one of them has developed hypothyroidism. Yeah, I think that the, 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 what I'll have to do is because we've got um, a local guy here who, who's done a bit of work in this area. So I'll, I'll maybe get back to you, Julia, if, if we could get the details of the lady with a more specific figure. Obviously, it depends whether it's identical or non-identical twins, but it, but we know that there is that the concordance in the context of identical twins is 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 it is significantly increased. I think it's fair to say, in the context of identical twins. So I can come back and give you a figure. But um, uh, I I I I but I agree with uh, with with James that um, you know that he, I, I think that that you you need to be mindful of the family history. But I'm not sure with that background that I'd have my thyroid function checked every six months. I might have it checked occasionally just to check that those, and, and obviously in line with what James had said earlier, if the antibodies were present, that in turn may um, have uh, helped you to tailor the frequency of thyroid function testing. But um, yeah, there is, there's clearly a significant genetic component. And I think twin studies in this context have been done. And, and there is a figure which I'll, I'll get back to you uh, with, uh, Julia. That, that's brilliant. I was going to say what, what we normally do at the end of these webinars is um, we produce a, a transcript of all the questions that have come up and we publish on the website and in the BTF newsletter as well. So um, anybody wants to go, go through them and we'll include the, result, the, the, the perfect answer to that question as well, Tim, if you can get back to us, that'd be great. And we'll, we'll publish that in a few weeks time when we've had a chance to do it. So uh, I'm going to put my sc screen back up again now and say thank you so much for, um, hopefully you can see that now. Thank you so much to Tim and James for a really, really interesting discussion. We've never done it this way before. So, but I, I think everybody would agree that just, just by listening to the two of you talk over these issues and, uh, uh, and interrupt each other with questions and confer with each other is really, really interesting. And the stories you gave about patients you've treated over the years and the studies that you, you, you're, not, you're familiar with, help bring it all to life so um 
I can't thank you enough. I think we, maybe this is a, a new model for BTF webinars that we we'll use in the future that will help us all. We didn't fall out either. We didn't. We didn't have any arguments. We were nice to each other, weren't we, James? <laughs> Very nice. You did an amazing job. Amazing job. Thank you. And thank you for everybody who added questions to, to the chat as well, because that really obviously only added to the to quality of the discussion we had. Anybody who joined late or would like to go back to, to, to listen again, there'll be a recording of the webinar um, on our website and on our YouTube channel. And you can look at the other webinars we've done as well in the collection on the YouTube channel. And we'll also, as I said, be doing a transcript of the questions so you can read them as well and, and share them around. Um, if any of you've got any other questions that you didn't think of at the time or would like um, to raise, you can get in touch in the normal way through our medical query answering service. You can see the, uh, the address for that on our website. And on our website, there's an awful lot of information for children and parents and also and um, about thyroid disorders generally and symptoms and treatments and also about managing the um, the symptoms of um, the, or living with a thyroid disorder which can always be helpful if any of you aren't familiar that we've, we've got a uh, um, a booklet for um, specifically for teenagers and young people uh, and lots of resources the films of young people talking about their own experiences so you might want to have a look at those as well so thanks again to our brilliant speakers. We, we know you're extremely busy people and we're really grateful that you've given up your time this evening to spend with us. And a huge thank you also to all the, the, the people, um, parents and young people too, who joined our webinar and asked questions. Please stay in touch with us. We look forward to seeing you at future events. If you would like to donate to BTF, we'd be ever so grateful because we're, we're struggling just like other charities are. So think, think of us. Um, so. I'm going to wind, finish the webinar now. Thank you again and have a nice rest of your evening. Goodbye.